we're making more progress now, yes, dear, we're making more progress now, yes, dear, we're making more progress now, still have a long way to go. They promise to bring us more revenue and quality, promise to bring us more revenue and quality, promise to bring us more revenue and quality, Winston is now on its way. Yes, dear, we're making more progress now, yes, dear, we're making more progress now, yes, dear, we're making more progress now, Second will help us all out. They promise to bring us more revenue and quality. Promise to bring us more revenue and quality. Promise to bring us more revenue and quality. Winchester's now on its way. Hello everybody, this is Brian O'Haran back again with Planning for Progress, uh, Planning for Success actually, or Progress, either one. Um, happy to be here. Uh, today I have a kind of a special introduction to the program. I want to talk about uh, how entrepreneurial businessmen think. I have many reasons for that, which I'll explain in a minute. But first, I want to introduce my guest today. Uh, on the wall you should see a picture of my old friend uh, classmate Charlie Tidwell, the world champion sprinter. Um, he had f held four world records in the 100 yard dash, 220, was a 220 uh, yard hurdler, um, and uh, he was on all the relay teams. And at the time that I knew him, he was the fastest man in the world before Bob Hayes. Um, God rest your soul, Charlie. Charlie's no longer with us. But uh, I knew him when I was at Kansas. He was on the Kansas. Uh, team and he was an excellent uh, sprinter, the best in the world. I have them there for a very good reason today because I want to talk about one of the things that Charlie taught me when I knew him. Charlie said that you need to get off the blocks fast and run like heck until you reach the finish line. That's one of the things that the entrepreneurs are doing in our town now. thought it quite appropriate that Charlie be with us for a little while today um, because our people are getting off the blocks fast, and they're going to run like heck until they get to the finish line. We will get the revenue into town eventually. It'll take quite a while, but we will get there. This isn't going to be a 100-yard dash. It could be more like the 10,000-meter uh, run that I tell you that uh, Billy Mills won in the Olympics. Um, but uh, we're, we're going to get moving. The, after that, you'll see another picture, the old uh, picture I used once before but all the original entrepreneurs that built this town and uh, also had to get off the blocks fast and, and run uh, rapidly. So um, as I watch the selectmen meetings now, I see um, and predicted in my past shows way back in the earlier days that the stratification between the businessmen 
and the non-business people at the selectmen meeting. It was very obvious in the last selectmen meeting, and uh, there's a reason for that. Um, that's why I was pushing uh, all along on my shows for all businessmen to run our business when the election happened. Now, we didn't get all businessmen. We got five businessmen. We got one educator, and, and we have one other person who is, uh, I don't know whether will be a businessman or not, but uh, we'll see. Time will tell uh, there. He's off to a good start, but um, I don't really know um, if he can keep up with these five businessmen. Time will tell that. Um, for one reason or another, we didn't get the seven businessmen. I'm still hoping we do next time around in two years when we have another election because I think it's very important. Seeing the frustration of the minority at the meetings, I decided to write this next few slides for the, this program. This is an attempt to help others in town understand that this will not be cured overnight, this frustration, if ever. But we must move on because there are many decisions that the non-businessmen may not be qualified to understand and may not be able to contribute to in a timely and meaningful way. And we see a little bit of that now in the frustration. Hence the them and us feeling that we, we um, get feedback from around town. Why is there a them and us feeling here? Why, why are the businessmen so strong? And why aren't the other people included more in a lot of the decision making? I hope what I'm going to say today helps. Successful entrepreneurial businessmen, and what you see here with these five businessmen, is you see, uh, at least among most of them, you see survival of the fittest. That's our friend Darwin again. These are people who made it. They're the best. Not everybody makes it. It's a very, very high dropout rate when people start small businesses and uh, entrepreneurs start businesses. It's up in a 90% or so of businesses that start in America don't succeed. These people have succeed and they are successful entrepreneurial businessmen. And successful entrepreneurial businessmen know, like Charlie did, that you have to get started fast and run like heck until you reach your goal. If you don't do that, you might not succeed and you might not stay in business. So it's very important. So successful entrepreneurs, and ours are all successful, do not think like most normal organizational experienced people. They don't, like, they don't think like people who are brought up in bureaucracies. They don't think like people who are brought up in large organizations that run by a different set of rules and procedures. Um, and uh, they don't really want to get caught in that trap. What they want to do is recreate the approach that made them successful and that they know and that they know works. Businessmen are more likely to size up a job requirement, for example, say the town manager or any other job, quickly, and then approach other successful people that they know and try to convince them to join their organization or recommend, or for them to recommend someone else that they know and trust for their job. If necessary, or to be a subcontractor. Right? So that's how they do it. They don't run uh, to the newspapers or to search organizations or they don't plan a big, uh, a big uh, process. What they do is they go and they ask people and they, they try to they rely on people they know and that they know the experience and that have probably worked with before and then they will try to attract that person. They often have to employ them for short periods of time, seasonal or by the job even. So they are willing to remunerate them when necessary more than, say, the going rate. They're always careful, of course, to watch their cost because that's, they need to break even at least to, to keep alive. But um, they're willing to do what they have to do, what's necessary to attract and keep good people. And they will always go out of their way when they have a good person to keep that person and to incent the person and to create the environment where the person can be successful. Um, they also have to encourage them to take difficult jobs or encourage them to devote more time and take more risk. 
This is, goes on every day in their businesses. And um, sometimes they have to not keep people. If the people aren't performing or aren't comfortable and aren't helping out, then um, they can't stay. If this approach does not bear fruit, then they will network. We call it networking in business. What you do is you start spreading the word everywhere, that, the type of person you're looking for, and you try to rely on personal mo references more than anything else. Um, and you do that from professional to professional in an attempt to find an exceptional person. For all sorts of reasons, the last thing that they want to do is advertise, use the internet. A lot of these people don't use the internet at all for many things. Um, it is a good tool, we know that. And in some professions, especially in large bureaucracies and organizations, it's absolutely essential. But in a lot of businesses, entrepreneurial business, not necessary at all. So you don't necessarily have to, to be that literate on a computer in many types of businesses. You certainly don't want to employ a search firm unless you have to. That's a long, drawn out. And that's usually done for a real exceptional uh, type at the top of large companies or places where you really want some exceptional uh, criteria that uh, you can't get through networking very easily. And search firms take years sometimes to find the right people for the right job. Successful entrepreneurs are good judges of people, very good judges of people. They have honed their skills to be able to do that. The unsuccessful ones are the 90% or so that aren't in business anymore. They didn't develop these skills. Um, and they're willing to take a certain amount of risk when they employ people. We know now that when we employ our new town manager, there will be risk involved. He may not have a job or she may not have a job uh, for, for much longer than a, a few months. Then again, they may. So uh, there is risk involved, and whoever does apply uh, must understand that, and all the cards must be on the table. But these entrepreneurs are used to working that way, so it's not a big problem for them. They're usually pretty good at sizing up people. Uh, it's one of the th skills that they develop over the years and have developed. These types of entrepreneurial business managers are usually result-oriented. They have to be. And they're used to financing things with their own money. That's very important. That doesn't happen in big bureaucracies. That doesn't happen in organizations where you, you might be where the number one union in the country is uh, involved. These people put up their own money or money that of other people that are their investors and they have to be very diligent with the use of that money. They're used to financing things with their own money or are entrusted with other people's money so they learn to judge quality. They have to learn to judge quality, experience and progress fast. They know that quality and time is money. If they make a mistake, which they often do, everybody makes a lot of mistakes. I once talked about how Ted Williams only batted 444 or so. They know they're going to make mistakes because they're moving fast. They need to move fast, like Charlie says, you got to run. And they're quick to rectify any situation because they'll set up a, a, a mechanism for finding out what the problems are and then fixing them. Um, that's the visibility they employ and the willingness to listen and uh, correct themselves. And they've already shown some examples of that. They're not perfect. They've gotten some feedback from people and from other selectmen, and, they're, and, they're, and they're, uh, they are showing signs of being able to, to um, absorb that and change. As I said before on previous programs, businessmen do not like surprises. They don't want any surprises. They want to know everything. We had an example of a surprise this week where the uh, people from the uh, um, uh, parts of town here um, didn't have a contract since last June. They were working without a contract since last June, and it wasn't that well known at the selectman level, at least uh, to the new selectman. Once they found out about it, they took immediate action. It'll take a while to resolve the problems, I'm sure, but, that, uh, but it will be done, and it'll be done rapidly. And, uh, and decisions will be made. 
They like visibility. Entrepreneurs love visibility because that's how they find out what's going on and that's how they change uh, their decision making when they find out that when things are going right, that's great. If they're not, they got to fix it. If they don't fix it, then they're out of business. It's their time and money. They want to deal with facts, as I said last week. Facts are very important. They need facts, not supposition. So you must understand that when you deal with these businessmen or when you see them in the selectmen meeting, they must have the facts. They're not very happy when they find out things are not factual. Not saying they don't make the odd mistake with the facts themselves or even myself. Well, everybody is human. We all make mistakes. And that's why I always say on this program, if you find out I'm making a mistake or I said the wrong thing, um, then correct me. Uh, through the email or through the post office box, and then I'll come on the program and fix it. Uh, people often say to me, Brian, you admit your mistakes on there. They, everybody thinks you're making mistakes all the time. I say, well, I'm going pretty fast here. Spend a lot of time every week preparing for this, and uh, I do make mistakes, but I do try to uh, correct them when I'm wrong. Often, when a businessman makes a mistake, if he doesn't have the visibility, he doesn't t make a decision, he doesn't correct it, it's very costly, and, and uh, they often pay dearly for their mistakes. So they are much more diligent afterward as they learn from their mistakes as well as their successes. They are human. Because of all this, they like to deal with well-experienced, reliable people and will keep responsible employees as long as they can. When people do leave for one reason or another, their organization, they try not to burn any bridges. As they may need the person again in the future, and vice versa. Often when people go their way, they do better than they did when they were here. And often they come back. Uh, this new town manager, uh, that uh, may, the fellow who's applied to be the new town manager may not be, but uh, he's applied. He was here before. And for one reason or another, he didn't stay. I think it was because he didn't, he, at the time, he was in a position where he couldn't become a resident. So he didn't stay. But he was here before, and he may come back again, and he may not. Entrepreneurs, although they learn from the past, do not like to dwell on the past, but they like to deal in the present and the future. Placing blame on past employees and past boards and past uh, people that used to be chairman of the boards and all that, it's not their style. We try not to do that. Again, once in a while they will make a mistake, but in general they're looking forward. They want to get to the next goal, not try to relive the past. Entrepreneurs do not rely on committees and commissions. They use committees and commissions, and they respect them for what they do, but they don't rely on them, especially large committees and commissions. They prefer to replace responsibility on people, on the line management. Saw some of that this week, again, where they're re reaffirming that we want the responsibility to be with the town manager. I'm going to talk a bit more about that during the program. But they prefer to place the responsibility on people and hold them accountable. I mentioned that last week that, hey, people want responsibility. They want the responsible jobs, and they have them. But then they have to accept the accountability. So we have to make sure that people are given the responsibility and then they're held accountable for decisions. And they don't try to blame those decisions on everybody else around them. That is how they grow people. Remember I mentioned on a previous show that responsibility is fertilizer. That's how people grow. If you're trying to learn a, an instrument, you have to practice. And that's how you grow. They grow people, and it grows organizations. That's how they can move fast to obtain quicker results. 
Businessmen like to get results. They love results. They don't like to fail. They're not losers. They want to win. And this fuels them. They don't like to waste time with unnecessary detail. That's what I called in previous shows bicycle shedding. They don't want to waste time with unnecessary detail. What they want is the bottom line. Just give them the bottom line. They're used to working with bottom lines. If they want to know more, they will ask specific questions. They do not like to deal with generalities. No presentations, please. Just a one-page summary. We, the other night we had a presentation, I think it lasted an hour. It was introduced for five or ten minutes. It was going to last ten or fifteen minutes. And it went on for an hour or more. And in my opinion, it wasn't even a policy uh, type, uh, type thing. It should have been done with the town manager outside of the select meetings, in my opinion. What the businessmen want to see is a one-page summary, if not a one-sentence or two-sentence summary, at the selectman meeting. And they want to know what the bottom line is. And then they will ask questions. And then they should move the question and come to a vote as soon as possible. Entrepreneurs do not shrink from decision-making. They are excellent decision-makers. They're always trying to make decisions themselves or get people to make decisions and get all their direct reports to make decisions, get all the people in the organization to make decisions. They want that to happen. They do not try to palm decisions, pawn decision making off onto someone else when it should be their decision or pawn it off onto a committee. Or pawn it off, or pawn it off on to a commission. They'll make decisions when they are presented with a need for the same, and will know that they may have to correct a percentage of them along the way. So the mechanisms need to be there for that management by exception when when the problems are pre, uh, given when the feedback is given to them. Entrepreneurs like to keep things moving forward with minimal calculated risk. There is always risk involved, but we should try to make it minimal at all times. That's one of the reasons that they prefer evolutionary approaches rather than revolutionary approaches, because it's quicker to, to see what's happening and to, to see if it's going in the right direction and to fix any problems as you go along. And lastly, I'd like to say here in this particular section that businessmen, especially entrepreneurs, are usually not crybabies. They don't tolerate crybabies very well. They are not paranoid. They do not think that any time something is mentioned in a selectman meeting that it's a criticism against them or it is negative feedback directed towards them as individuals. And they don't take uh, comments as being, unless they are, specifically directed at them as individuals. They don't take them personally. They look for feedback and use it as a tool to improve their behavior and that of their organization. Now, I hope this information that I just gave you and talked to you about will help you to understand the selectmen when you watch a selectman's meeting. It will help you to understand why it is so difficult for them to have a harmonious relationship throughout the whole group of selectmen. It's difficult for the minority because they don't have the same experiences as the majority. And it's difficult for the majority because they grew up in a different environment than the minority in this particular case. So it's always going to be a communication problem. 
And I did say when we were talking before the election that we, if we had all businessmen, then they would all be able to communicate properly and well. And they wouldn't be looking for um, why, does, why do these people do things differently than we did things in the last um, a group of selectmen. We did things differently before because hey, we had people with different experiences before. Um, and uh, as long as we have the businessmen in the majority, they will be trying to employ the techniques. That's why we elected them. We elected them because they have this approach, because they are this way, because they can help us get out of intensive care. So please take that into consideration. I do get a lot of people in town say, Brian, why don't they take more time? Why don't they go slower? Why don't they include everybody in all their decisions? And I say, well, you know, there's just some times when you, you're in intensive care, when you've got to get on with things and you've got to keep moving. And that's what's happening now. You're watching it before your very eyes, and every week I will show you some examples of where, the, where these things happen and try to educate you all so that the next time when you vote, you will vote, hopefully, for more businessmen. Now I'm going to use the slides because I'm going to go over the meeting that happened on Monday, the selectmen's meeting with you, and I want to go through it, and I want to point out some things. The first thing I want to say, and I want to be objective about this, is that uh, the policy, non-policy ratio that I've been talking about on these meetings, on these programs, and I have a slide later to show you, was 18 to 1. There were 18 policy discussions in that meeting, give or take one. I think I might have made one mistake here. but And one non-policy subject. Now, when I say policy, I use the term very loosely because a lot of the things we do that, I call that we call policy here right now are because the charter says we need to do them. In a business, Probably out of those 18, 15 or 16 wouldn't even be there. They would have been delegated to the town manager. Now, this was a very long meeting this time for several reasons. It should have been a, probably a half an hour meeting. It was more like a three hour meeting. I didn't time it, but, and a lot of that was taken up by a presentation that I don't even think should have been in the meeting. That should have been given to the town manager in his office, and he should have given a brief summary to the selectmen and then gone from there, if at all. Basically, if you're in charge of the budget, which a town manager is, then you're going to want to be looking all the time for less expensive fuels and less expensive um, everything, right? So that's the town manager's job, to do that all the time. You don't need a commission to do that. But what improvement that is, talking about 18 things that are policy in a policy meeting. That's wonderful. 18 to 1. What an improvement in just six weeks. Number two, the meeting was way too long. Way too long. The misunderstanding over the minutes was drawn out and shouldn't even have been there. I mean, that, that kind of stuff should be done before the meeting. Somebody call up Sheila, the town clerk, and say, um, Hey, I think I have some problems in the minutes. Can you please correct them? And then if they are brought up at the, uh, at the selectman meeting, it should be done much quicker than it was this time. In general, there was too much unnecessary discussion, in my opinion. The selectman should have moved the question much faster than they did. Should have had a little bit of discussion on each issue but not belabor the discussion and repeat it. There's a lot of repetition. That w people of that caliber shouldn't need the repetition. So they should have moved the question. I would encourage all the selectmen to move the question much sooner in most cases. Several selectmen, a few of the selectmen, not several, but a few of the selectmen, one or two, maybe three, selectmen made some comments in the meeting that probably were best left out of the meeting and not told 
and selectmen in front of TV and the newspaper and everything. So I would say, as selectmen, be careful that you don't say things like personnel things or that you um, make comments about what was said in other meetings, uh, which may or may not be true, and things like that. Uh, you should, should kind of avoid that. That's kind of getting back into the more non-business-like approach to running a meeting. Now I'm going to go through each of the things here. I've put colors on them. The green is for um, is for the, what I consider the uh, non-policy. These are all, I, people can argue with me about these, and they might win. Uh, but this is my Brian's view here. So please remember that it's Brian's view. Policy is uh, an interesting word. I gave you the definition many times. I'm not going to do that anymore. You can go to the dictionary yourself now if you want. But the biodiesel presentation was non-policy, in my opinion, unnecessary, should have been given to the town manager uh, in his office. And even if it was at the second meeting, it should have been held to the five or ten minutes that they said they were going to do. They said, I think, ten or fifteen minutes or whatever. But, you know, it got dragged out. It wasted a lot of people's time, including the public's time. And um, that's not good. Next was the good liaison reports. Thank you very much for the liaison reports. Um, they were informative, and uh, we're happy to see those. That was a policy. The town manager's report. I think, uh, and this is Brian's opinion only, and it's not criticism on anybody right now. We have a brand new town manager, interim town manager, and uh, he's finding his feet, and it takes him a little while to get on there. And I did have a meeting with him this week for an hour or so. It was very productive. I'm very impressed with him and his ability to lateral think. I'll use some examples of that in the future programs from examples I talked to him about. But um, the town manager's report, uh, uh, in my opinion, the first thing that should be on it, as I said in previous programs, is where do we stand on the budget, this year's budget? Uh, are we on budget or not? And has, has anything uh, been done this week to uh, keep us, last two weeks, to keep us on budget. And when I say budget, I mean revenue and expense, not just expense, but the revenue and expense. Um, the other thing I think that needs to be done in the town manager report is we need to be able to start getting some visibility into the 208-209 revenue and budget planning progress. Projection, progress projections probably need some policy direction, like from the selectmen, what, what will be our policy for the next year's budget? Uh, needs to be something said about that to the town manager so he can then plan the budget with his people in a, in a uh, cooperative manner and be back by Mar the March 15th deadline that uh, he has by charter to bring a budget to the selectmen. I think the bottom-up approach that, uh, that we've been, this is, again, just Brian's view, the bottom-up approach that we've been taking is that's one of the reasons we have all these referendums. If we give them a, uh, a target and say that will perhaps be satisfactory for the town and the taxpayers uh, and the Board of Education, uh, although the, never, not everybody will always be happy with these things, then maybe we can give some top-down direction. Then the people can go off and do their budgets accordingly we won't have to have the, all these uh, reviews at the selectman level over every penny and, uh, and go, go around and around and around with many referendums. Nobody wants to repeat the seven referendum thing we went through a few years ago. So I think we ought to be talking more about that. This should be the second thing on the town manager's report. What he did talk about, though, and I didn't put down everything he talked about, but he did say there's a 30-year-old generator in the town hall that uh, the police are dependent on, and if it doesn't work. And when I went to the policeman meeting, they did say they were out for one or two days um, at one time with all their computers, and that means when their computers are out, their business pretty well shuts down. So um, not, not, not the policemen on the street and all, but uh, it is, you know, they kind of run their business now with the computers, and they're very necessary. So that was brought up, and I'm sure that will be looked into. The good news on the retirement side is that the retirement fund is in excellent shape. And as you know, around the world, around America now, there are a lot of retirements that aren't in excellent shape. So uh, the retirement fund looks uh, like it's in pretty good shape. People are happy with that. Uh, 
Look at all that red. That means policy when you see this slide. Um, there you go. Uh, we reinforce the town manager's personally, personal responsibility. That's always been our policy. Somewhere it got lost along the way, I think, and people weren't really following it as uh, thoroughly as they should have. And uh, that has been reinforced by the mayor and the selectmen, and the town manager is, uh, uh, is responsible for the personnel, uh, and, and um, it's, his, it's his ball of wax there. Cary Avenue Lots, that I think was good. They're uh, devoted to on, that, on, the, on the sale of those. Norcross Road to the public uh, meeting is um, uh, want to put it out for sale, and they have to go to a public meeting for that. That'll be on January 21st at 7 p.m. That's positive, and I'm glad to see that. Uh, the, the collector of revenue uh, refunds were approved. That's good. That has to come to the selectmen under the existing charter. Uh, clarify the town manager's compensation, part of the previous motion. I think it was table. I think that was more of a clarification thing, like, you know, what was it part of the uh, um, was it part of the motion that was held when we when we uh, agreed to have the, the interim town manager or not? That'll be clarified. I hope by the next meeting, if not before. Uh, discuss the town manager search. There was a, a long, drawn-out conversation about that. Uh, and uh, that went into executive session, which happened on uh, Wednesday, December 19th. And uh, from what I gather, they interviewed the candidate, and uh, they have now put in, uh, into place a process for uh, finding a new town manager interim or not by um, the 1st of March. There's a series of steps there. They're all in the newspaper. You can see those. But they're hoping by the 1st of March to have a, a, uh, a town manager, another interim town manager, uh, perhaps longer if the charter does not get revised. Public works contract, that was the surprise. There hasn't been any since June of 07. They were working on it. That's not good enough, uh, and, but we got to get it done. So that was also discussed supposed to be discussed. I don't know. I don't know what happened in the executive session, but that was supposed to be dis discussed in the same executive session on December 19th. Uh, but that's a personnel matter, so uh, it didn't make the newspapers. The next is the town manager was, uh, was uh, approved to sign the Still River Agreement. That's good. Um, the next was a motion to appoint a town attorney. There was a long discussion about that, and uh, that was tabled, uh, probably for good reason. Uh, there was some uh, confusion about it. That was uh, good feedback that people gave, and uh, there will be action taken on that one way or another. We'll find out at the next meeting, uh, when they have the next select meeting, what will happen there. There were differences of opinion about how the whole thing went, so it was tabled, and uh, we'll find out what happens next time. Um, they wanted to form an energy commission. They tabled that. I think that's bad that they tabled it. I think they should not even bother with it. But uh, again, that's just Brian's opinion. We don't need one of those. What you do is you tell the town manager every time somebody in public works or wherever goes around to change a light bulb, they put in one of the new ones and maybe even have a plan to go ahead and put in all the new ones. But that's really the town manager's responsibility to make sure that we use our budgets efficiently when it comes to energy. So um, I don't really think they need a commission to go around counting light bulbs, like was pointed out in the program. Now, I'm not trying to demean anybody in that. I think the, the energy policy and all is very important, and that we do keep up with the state of the art, and that we do things that we can afford and that are cost uh, productive. But uh, I don't think we need a commission for that. I think that's uh, a mistake if we do that. Doesn't mean we won't get a commission. It just means that Brian doesn't think we need one. Um, next is that we uh, we approve the uh, police department fund transfer. That's another thing I think that perhaps uh, is a charter thing. Uh, uh, there was a small amount of money. It was moved from one one line item in the budget to another. But anyway, it was done in a short period of time and was positive. Um, 
It did take a while for it to get there, though. You see, these meetings only happen every two weeks. So meanwhile, the poor police department is waiting for these decisions to be made. And uh, this came up at a couple of selectmen meetings, so it could be take a whole month to get some kind of these decisions made. That's the problem with bringing them all up to the selectmen level. So the charter's revised. That's something they probably should have a pretty good look at. They dissolved two commissions. Good, in my opinion. <laughs> Whenever you dissolve a commission, that's good. Put the responsibility on line management. Now, commissions are good in general. There are some commissions you need, and we have some. We have an inland development commission, which is necessary. We have a planning and zoning commission. We have a development commission, those kind of commissions. But you really got to be careful when you, when you start establishing commissions. And so not to have them is probably better than having them. Um, uh, commissions and uh, committees tend to be um, tools used in big uh, bureaucracies and small bureaucracies. Uh, I've had people tell me, Brian, you don't understand. Government moves slow, <laughs> very slow, you know. And I say, well, you don't understand. All governments have a mechanism to also move fast when they have to. They can't just move slow. We had to get the uh, year 2000 changes in by the year 2000, you know. We couldn't move slow. We had to move fast. So. All governments are set up to move fast when they have to. We can do that too. The tax deferral plan was tabled because uh, for one reason or another we didn't get around to getting the data necessary. And the Winston Furniture Company, uh, which is even questionable whether it's a policy issue or not, uh, but I put it down as policy given the benefit of the doubt because one of the things they want to do is get the policy squared away for all these buildings, old buildings we have down here in the center of town. So now. Uh, the colors I used, I put on here. I don't know if you can see them on there. I'll just lift this up a second. But policy, non-policy, policy's red, non-policy's green, and Brian's comments are in yellow. So that's what's happening there. Now we're going to talk a bit about the financial update for today. Um, you just leave that on there. Okay. Um, Revaluation, the vision appraisal meetings with residents are taking place. And... Um, People are going in now and asking why. Why did things happen the way they did? The initial uh, 2000, uh, 2009 budget mill rate will be available to the selectmen around March 15th by charter. There were questions about that in the selectmen meeting, but the charter is very specific about when the mill rate is calculated. There's one calculated on March 15th. That's a, very, that's a rough one when the town manager gives his, it's needed for the town manager to give his budget to the selectmen. And then there's a final one calculated, right? So, so right in the charter, uh, will be available shortly after the approval of the budget at the referendum. This year's budget has been forecast as running over, as we all know. Doesn't mean it will run over, and they're working on that. But uh, uh, it's been forecast as running over, and a spending freeze is still in place. Um, remember, that spending freeze doesn't apply to contracts that we, we have committed to. We have to keep going with those. Um, as we stand now. And we have not yet, as I know, put a hiring freeze on, on the town. Okay, the next is we have to look forward to hearing the latest budget status from the town manager, I hope, the message is Brian's wish, at the next selectman's meeting. Doesn't mean it'll be there then, but that's what I'd like to see. I have some references here from the town charter. I'll just put them up there. You can all go get the charter in the town hall. And you can see all these references to when the mill rate is calculated and when it should be given out. And there's a reason for that. The reason is if you give the mill rate out too quickly when we haven't even finished any of the work yet, all the work yet, then it's, it's not good. It misleads uh, people. And uh, unless you're really an expert on the mill rate, which few people are, it's very confusing for the majority of taxpayers. That's why that's in the charter. And... Uh, It'll probably stay there for quite a long time. Notices for this week. Number one, an interview was held on Wednesday night uh, with, the town, with the one town manager candidate who happened to be in town for personal reasons and asked for an interview. Um, his name is Paul Vayer. Uh, I can only say that because the newspapers had it in there this morning, a uh, former town manager. I don't know the person. I wasn't here when he was town manager. Can't give you opinion one way or the other. Um, a schedule has been agreed unanimously by the selectmen, according to the newspaper, um, 
for interviewing and hiring a new town manager to be on board by March 1st, 2007. That's very important because uh, the existing um, interim town manager must leave at the end of February. Some December revaluation uh, re results are being appealed now as we speak. Look at your notice for the final appeal date with the Town Appeals Board. I don't know whether that's up or not, but it's on the notice that was sent to you with your new re reval um, assessed value. Now, I'm going to give you some of the revaluation criteria because everybody keeps asking me about it. And uh, I went to a special meeting with the, uh, the other day with uh, several people. There was one selectman there and uh, people from the assessor's office and one of the officials from Vision Appraisal. And we went over things for an hour, an hour and a half or so. And I just want to say that here's the kind of criteria. That there's a whole book in the assessor's office. It's got a brown cover on it. It tells you all the things they do when they do an assessment. How many, they count this, they count that, they include this, they include that. But I'm just going to give you right now, just because everybody's so curious about it, very high level look. The sales over the last two years is what they use in, the, in, in your area and around in your neighborhood. And when you go for, um, and you go to get uh, your, your appeal reviewed with vision appraisal, they have pictures of all these houses that have sold in the last couple of years right in the hallway in the town hall and you can see, you can see some of them. I'm not sure they got them all there, but they got, a, they got most of them I think. At least. At least they got samples from each area of town so you can get an idea in your area of town what has sold. The other thing is they're very, very interested in topography. And especially areas that are in hilly areas or very slopey areas or very flat areas. There's so many differences, infinite number of differences in topography. They've categorized them and uh, they go around and they check topography. And they give you a plus or a minus or an, or an even based upon your topography. Um, they're always balancing things. They're always trying to look around town to see if things are balanced and that one area isn't being treated unfairly over another. Adjustments are made all the time during the last five years since the last reval, so they have to bring all the, everything up to date with all the adjustments that have been made and make sure they're relayed around town fairly. Um, the change in quality. If there's been any change in quality in your house, you've added to it or subtracted from it or uh, whatever, then the, or it's deteriorated, they will either give you a plus or a minus or an even for that. The condition of the house, if it's paint's all peeling off or this and that, you might get uh, uh, a deduction for that. If, uh, um, and if it's an excellent condition, you'll have a different value than somebody who's in poor or mediocre condition. Uh, location's very important, whether you're on the lake or in the town of Winchester or um, live next to a big silo or something that uh, um, uh, you will get a different uh, view there. And of course, view is important to them, very important. Uh, they, uh, they measure that everywhere they go, not just around here. And they have, well, I don't know, 10 gradients of view, and you fall into one of the categories. And they'll tell you which one you fall into if you go down and talk to them. Now, I separated the lake out here because the lake uh, has water access. Other places, there's other lakes too. I'm just talking about any lake here. And uh, you're either on the water, or off the water, or have access to the water. And they give you different um, uh, scales for that. And then uh, Highland Lake in particular, they used to have three regions up there. Now they've got two. So that was a change that was made in the last five years that has confused people a bit. So the meeting was held on December 18th and uh, with vision appraisal. And I was in attendance there. And I, I, uh, I reviewed my list of questions that I had talked to you about on the a program over the, over the weeks. Uh, and uh, I went over the questions and I got my answers. And uh, in addition to that, I went in and reviewed my own property with vision appraisal and got a good understanding there. There were one or two mistakes on my card and uh, they're going to take that into consideration. I don't know whether it'll add tax or decrease tax, but, uh, but I did what I wanted to do so that I could better understand how my house was evaluated and how all the houses were evaluated and how the lake was evaluated uh, one side versus the other and also the lake versus the rest of the town. So um, I personally got a lot out of it and I thank Vision Appraisal and the town employees for working and letting us do that. Now I'd like to put up a hospitality 
hospitality, I always have trouble with the word, policy. Um, and this here is a little tough love. I want to say that uh, the Inland Wetland Commission, in my opinion, is a very good commission. They do a lot of good work. We have to have them by state uh, law, statute, and we need them anyway. And uh, I've always said on this program that barring one thing, I think uh, they're excellent. Uh, but as far as hospitality is concerned, um, we have a developer trying to come to town and uh, spend $300 million improving our, our town at a time when we are in great need. We're in intensive care for revenue. Um, it was scheduled in the last Inland Wetlands to begin the Winchester State uh, uh, Second Review. And he had to sit in there with his expert until 11 o'clock until he got on the agenda. He came from afar, you know, an hour or so away. He had to sit there at 11 p.m. or so to be heard. Um, his expert, he had to pay his expert to do that, and the expert had to sit there as well. And then they had to go home afterwards. It could have been even later. I've seen it happen later. It could have been earlier, too. But uh, part of the reason he was on the end of the agenda was because he, he handed in, you know, his application came in pretty late in the process. I understand that. But if the meeting didn't last till 11 p.m., he wouldn't have had to stay there till 11 p.m. So I have a real problem with that, and uh, I think we can do better. We need to treat our guests more hospitably and uh, especially people who are trying